Hi, this is episode 72 of Krondos. I'm your host, Jordan Hudgens. I'm a Ruby dev and the CTO of the DevCamp platform. Today, I'm gonna to walk through examples of metaprogramming. And don't run away. Metaprogramming is one of the more misunderstood topics in development. However, it's actually quite easy to understand if you look past the confusing name and the examples where people give it too much complexity. If you're like me, the first time I heard the term metaprogramming, my eyes kind of glazed over. But let's take a look at what metaprogramming actually is, and later on we'll review some practical examples for how to use it. Technically, metaprogramming is code that writes code. However, before you get visions in your mind of robots writing code to take over the world, understand it's actually much less intense. Instead, metaprogramming allows programs to create methods on the fly instead of having to define them in the program itself. Let's begin with a basic example. I'm going to start with an example from the Ruby on Rails framework. Imagine that you have a database table for users that have columns such as name and email. Obviously, the Ruby on Rails framework doesn't know what columns that you're going to have for the user database, which may cause you to be surprised that this database query will actually work. So how exactly does the method find by email work when the method wasn't defined by you or the framework? Is it some kind of dark magic? Not exactly. Instead, the Rails framework dynamically creates methods based on the column names in your database. So essentially, the method is never defined. Instead, it is generated on the fly by leveraging metaprogramming techniques. When I'm learning a new topic, I like to start with a walkthrough of base case examples. With that in mind, we're gonna follow that pattern in this guide for metaprogramming. All of the examples we're going to go through will be in the Ruby language. I chose Ruby because it has one of the more flexible metaprogramming interfaces and it's also very expressive, which means I think you'll be able to understand it better even if you're not that familiar with the language itself. There are actually a number of ways to implement metaprogramming and the method you choose should be dictated by what type of feature you need to build. A few of the key options are one, leveraging monkey patching, two, defining methods at application runtime, and three, to define methods on the fly. If number two and three sound familiar, it's because they're very, very much the same, but we're gonna walk through some of the subtle differences with the examples and when to use number two versus number three. Starting off the list for examples with metaprogramming is monkey patching. Yes, it's a weird name, but it's a powerful and sometimes dangerous tool. Monkey patching is an object-oriented programming technique that allows developers to open up classes and add or alter built-in behavior. Let's take a look at this code example. In this file, I've opened up the built-in Ruby string class. Inside of the class, I've added a new method called gibberish that simply returns a string of random characters. If I call the method on a string, it no longer prints out the string that was entered and instead prints out the random set of string characters. This is monkey patching in action. It essentially lets you open up classes and alter behavior, whether it's adding new methods or changing methods. I mentioned earlier that this can be a dangerous practice. Let's see why. Ruby has a built-in method in the string class called upcase. It, all it does is it converts all the characters to uppercase values. What would happen if we messed with the upcase method? If you guessed that it would cause some nasty and confusing errors, you'd be 100% correct. Even if your monkey patch method didn't cause an error, it could cause some negative side effects throughout the program if any other developers are relying on the method that you altered because they're expecting it to return one thing, but you overrode that basic or default action and now it's doing something else. For that reason, it's important to proceed with caution whenever it comes to performing monkey patching. Typically, I won't override Ruby core methods, and that's kind of a considered a best practice. So when is monkey patching a good idea? I've had a number of times where outside libraries were causing issues in a program I was working on. Sometimes it could be because of namespacing or different things like that. By leveraging monkey patching, I was able to fix the bugs, which didn't cause any negative side effects on the program for me or other developers. 
Next on the list for examples of metaprogramming is defining methods at application runtime. What exactly does this mean? Well, have you ever had a set of methods that were very similar? Let's imagine that we have a book class that prints out details about each genre of books in our application. Do you notice how similar the methods look? This is a really poor programming practice because it requires us to change each method whenever we have to update the output for a book's genre details. Wouldn't it be nice if we could simply define the method one time and then have the methods for genre generated each time the program runs? Well, thankfully, we can do that leveraging metaprogramming. We can get rid of all of the manual method calls and simply list the genres in an array. From there, we can loop through the list and call define method. This will generate the full list of methods, just like we had before, except now, whenever we have to change the details and the functionality, we'll only have to make the change in a single place. This is a great tool for removing duplicate code in classes, and I find it helpful in many applications that I work on. Last on the list of metaprogramming implementations is to define methods on the fly. This option is one of the most powerful, but also one of the most confusing implementations available. So let's walk through it as practically as possible. Continuing with our book example, let's imagine that you need to create a feature for searching through your list of authors. But instead of manually querying author details, you wanna have custom methods available to use. This type of design pattern is used frequently when building code libraries such as RubyGems. So for example, we want methods such as author underscore genre to print out the author's genre. However, the tricky part is that our library may not know what the database column names will be. It could be genre, or it could be summary, etc. With this in mind, we can't use define underscore method because we don't know the exact names to put in a list. This is where method missing comes in. Whenever Ruby comes across a method that isn't defined in a program, it looks to see if the developer implemented the method missing construct. Essentially, you can use method missing to let the program know of any types of methods you want to be generated on the fly. In this program, I'm using the OpenStruct library to mimic creating an author database. In a real world program, we'd use a database, but the functionality from a metaprogramming implementation perspective is actually the same. The code explanation is a little out of scope for this guide. If you want to deep dive into a method missing tutorial, I have a full section dedicated to metaprogramming in my comprehensive Ruby programming course. You can check the show notes if you'd like to check that out. At a high level, we're defining the method missing method, which is something that Ruby looks for whenever it encounters any method that isn't explicitly defined in the class. From there, we're passing in the name of the attribute that we're looking for, such as genre or first name. From that point, we tell method missing to pass that information to our mocked database to retrieve the attribute that we called. This means that author underscore genre will actually function like a method, even though it was never explicitly defined by us in the method, which is really cool. It's also important to implement respond to missing, since that's a tool that many developers use to ensure that a method has been made available via metaprogramming. It may seem like method missing and define method are pretty similar, and they are. The key to remember is that define method generates the methods where the application starts and is typically based on a list of predetermined values. But method missing is more dynamic and is checked whenever the method is called. That gives it more flexibility and it's considered one of the most critical aspects of implementing metaprogramming in Ruby programs. As great as it is, and as helpful as going through examples of metaprogramming is, you should make sure to use it with caution. Through the years, I've witnessed many metaprogramming implementations, and I've seen where they could have overcomplicated a code base. As you may have noticed, processes such as method missing are more challenging to read compared with normal Ruby code.
This means that programs filled with metaprogramming modules can make it difficult to work with for new developers. So make sure you consider the long-term side effects of your metaprogramming implementations. Just because you've created a metaprogramming component that works doesn't mean that you should include it in your code base. Like many other pieces of your program, metaprogramming features should be easy to understand and should be modular so they can be changed in the future. Because remember the number one rule of development, program requirements always change. I hope that this has been a helpful list of examples of metaprogramming and that you have a good idea on how you can effectively utilize it in your next project.